Hey everybody, hello from snowy, freezing Texas, and it is Thursday, February 2nd, Groundhog's Day. The groundhog saw his shadow, so we're in for another couple weeks of winter, if you believe that. We're having a little bit of trouble here in Texas with some freezing ice that's caused a big issue all around the state, but specifically where I am. So we're experiencing some power outages, some Wi-Fi outages, so fingers crossed we're able to do this interview because one of the things that we learned today had nothing to do with the weather. We would expect some weather-related news in February, but the news that we received from the Defense Department today wasn't something that we expected, and it is history-making in a few different ways. So earlier today, we get this press release from the Defense Department about the first detainee held at Guantanamo Bay who's being resettled, meaning they're being removed from the prison there and resettled in another country. And interestingly enough, this is actually taking place in the Western Hemisphere, which we often don't see, in the country of Belize, which is also something that we often don't see. So just wanna give you a little background on this, and then I'm gonna bring in our guest because we have someone with such a unique perspective, someone who's actually spent time at Guantanamo Bay. You know her, writer, war correspondent, Holly McKay, and she was just there at Guantanamo Bay for eight days. There's a lot of people that can talk about Guantanamo Bay. There are very few who have spent time like that there. So Holly's gonna give us some perspective about what, what is it actually like. But first, let me just tell you about this detainee. So overall, just big picture. At one point, we had hundreds and hundreds of detainees at Guantanamo Bay at the prison there. That opened in 2002. We've had the base in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba um, for more than 100 years. We're leasing it, actually. 45 square acres, it's a big area. But when we're talking about Gitmo, we're really talking about the prison. And so we've had hundreds of prisoners go through there. Right now, according to the Defense Department, um, we have 34 detainees. So we've slowly, we've slowly gone through the detainees. Many of them obviously have been released. There's been a lot of controversy about that. There's been a lot of controversy about the legalities of, of Gitmo. But let's talk about this person that was released. What's interesting about this particular detainee, and I have a picture of him, um, he's actually the only detainee at Gitmo that was also a, a legal US resident. He went to high school outside of Baltimore. So he spent some of his younger years in the United States. 2002, he travels to Pakistan, and according to the United States government, hooks up with some of the key leaders in Al-Qaeda and spent time working with them. Eventually, he's taken into custody by the United States. Uh, he's been, he was held overseas before he was then brought to Gitmo. Uh, in 2012, he actually had a plea agreement. Part of that agreement was to serve a decade, so he did serve a decade. He had time served. And now he's at the point where he is going to be released. We're watching this carefully because one of the promises made by the Biden administration and President Biden coming into office was to shut down Gitmo. Gitmo is a bipartisan problem. You know how much I love nonpartisan news. And I like these stories where we can really look at Democrats and Republicans in an issue and say, well, listen, both parties have had an issue with Gitmo and what to do about Gitmo. Uh, what do you do with the remaining detainees? And there's some really big names, which was part of the reason that Holly McKay was there. So let me see if I can bring Holly in here because there's a bigger picture here, right? It's about the safety and security of the United States of America. And Gitmo was thought to be um, key to that, especially in the war on terror. There she is. Hi, Holly. So I'm so curious, Hi. how did you get to Gitmo? How did that door even open for you to go spend some time at Guantanamo Bay? So I was actually invited by a press officer at the DOD who had read my work and um, reached out to me actually on LinkedIn and, and we ended up having coffee and talking about it and he essentially invited me because you do have to get permission from the Office of the Secretary of Defense to go and you have to have a letter. Um, and so when that was sort of all arranged, I was going really to cover the pretrial of a man named Nashiri, who was responsible for the USS Cole bomb attack. And that actually happened before 9-11. And that was where our, I think, gosh, it was, a, I can't remember the exact figure, but there was a dozen, I think at least a dozen uh, US sailors were killed in a, in a bomb in, in the port of Yemen in Aden. Um, so that was a really, that was sort of Al Qaeda's very first kind of really big attack. Um, and that happened in 2000. And so this man was captured in 2002. And so he has been in Guantanamo Bay. And if you can imagine, it's not even in a trial, it's in a pretrial. Um, 
all these years later. So that sort of just shows you where Guantanamo Bay is at. So the way that I got in was there really is only a one flight and it leaves from Andrews Air Base in Maryland. And it's a, it's sort of a commercial airliner, but it's sort of a private commercial airline. I mean, that's where all the lawyers, all the aid workers, all the kind of civilians um, go in and out of Guantanamo Bay. And it typically only runs, you're lucky if the plane runs once a week in and out. Um, so that's sort of why you have to stay uh, for a sort of a significant period of time. When you what get was there. it like when you first walked off the plane? What did it look like? So it's about a three hour flight and you, there's sort of two islands in Guantanamo Bay. So you, you land um, and then you've got to wait a really long time for a ferry to come and then you have to take a ferry uh, across to the other island to kind of get there. And it's beautiful. I mean, the seas are beautiful. It's Cuba. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, but when you get to Guantanamo Bay and, and I think we forget too, it's, it's a military base. And before that it, it ever had um, you know, Camp Delta and Camp X-Ray and that whole part of it, it was a military base and will still be a military base long after um, those those camps have kind of closed down. Um, and so you sort of have, um, it's sort of a strange kind of environment. It's very much, it's a base. People get along with their lives. Um, the area where they do the trials and things is called Camp Justice. And that's sort of where I spent a lot of time. But really of what I found really interesting about it was of all the places that I've worked and all the bases that I've visited around the world, this was absolutely the most restrictive. Um, we weren't allowed to take photos without permission. We had somebody from sort of the office of security at the end of that week going through my phone, looking at all my photos, telling me what to delete. Um, I've never encountered that, never in Kabul, never in Baghdad, never in active war zones have I ever had um, that we, we were not, yeah, so we couldn't just walk around and take photos without permission. Um, journalists, and mind you, when I was there, there was only me and uh, Carol Rosenberg, who was been kind of there for a long time for the New York Times. Um, but we have to go around, we have to wear badges that say we're a journalist and all the time, you know, as we, anytime we're, we're out and about kind of doing our thing, we either have to have an escort or we are allowed to go to, you know, the store or the cafe or I'm allowed to go for a run by myself. But other than that, I always have to have a, a press person with me. Um, and so you have to wear this badge and that's basically like a warning to anyone else not to sort of come up and, and talk to you or run their mouth. So they're very, very paranoid about it to the point where, you know, you, you try to make requests to get each side of the story. I try to make a request to the office, uh, the prosecutor's office, which is the U.S. government. Um, it's always denied. And, you know, I'm told that that is that is typical. They don't let journalists, um, they don't let journalists, you know, speak necessarily. Um, we're not allowed to go to the part where the detainees are held. Um, so there's just sort of a lot of restrictions. And when you are somebody that is trying to get every side of the story, it's very frustrating because on one hand, the government won't talk to you, the US government won't talk to you, but yet I can sit all day. You know, I spend a lot of time with Nishiri's uh, chief defense counsel, um, and they're happy to talk to you. They're happy to sit, they're happy to tell you their side, his side. Um, and then when you have the other side that simply won't um, even sort of put out their perspective and that just seem to be incredibly paranoid for no reason, I think that drives a lot of the negativity in Gitmo. And then journalists go in there and they come back and they write these sort of stories about this shadowy place and what is going on in those detention camps and um, what human rights abuses are happening. And I don't necessarily have anything to think that is still happening. But yet the way that it's sort of dealt with, I think, from a press perspective, mm is a lot to be bargained for because when you don't have the facts a lot of journalists will then kind of um go uh, go about it and putting their own two cents into that and i think that has created the narrative that surrounds me so, so you're, you've been invited but then your hands are really held as far as anything that you're doing there and then you're looking for an actual for example statement or being able to talk to someone in the u.s government for their side and even though you've been in invited by the u.s government you can't get a statement from them. So that would be pretty frustrating. Did, were you, so, yeah. you know, kind of big picture when we're looking at this, for example, this particular detainee, he was at one point described as a high value detainee. And obviously um, his, his side probably would debate that. But at this point, the U.S. government and whoever was defending him had come to some sort of agreement many, many years ago. And his release at this point seems to be part of that agreement in the past. But one of the big controversies obviously about Guantanamo Bay is, is 
how to legally handle the people that are being held. Do they go through a typical court? If you decide to shut down the prison, do you bring them to New York and put them through federal court in New York and house them in New York City? It's been a very big debate about what's the right process, what's the most American way to do it. And so were you able to actually witness any of the pre-trial? Did you see some of the legal proceedings? Yeah, I did. I, I spent a week in pre-trial. So how it sort of works is they have the courtroom and it's sort of this very post-COVID hybrid system where a lot of it is happening um, in Virginia. Um, so you have these big screens in the courtroom where you've got different government people giving testimony that are happening on the screens. And then you've got a lot of the defense that are also are doing it remotely as well. And then some in person, like Nishiri will come to the court and his, uh, his defense will be there and the judge is there and um, a few different people. And then as press people, we are in the back and there's a big glass sort of covering so we can't hear and we have mon we can see but it's a 40 second delay so it's very strange so we have monitors and so what you're hearing on the monitors and then you're seeing something 40 seconds in advance so it is a kind of a bizarre um setup and there's actually families of victims and they also come and they sit sort of in there's a, a petition and then they sit on the other side next to us so they're also sort of privy so anyone that's not um, privy to you know a top secret uh, clearance that can't hear everything that's going on and often you'll the monitor will be pulled and that is again it's being pulled remotely um, what my understanding is typically from the agency in in, uh, in Virginia in Langley because whether it's maybe they're discussing something classified that can't be heard um, or this is something that they don't want made public and often that has to do with the black sites and uh, the sort of the enhanced interrogation techniques and and that in my sort of research of it that has actually been hugely detrimental in the reason I think why these trials haven't moved forward and why we're looking at this for so long because there is so much information that is basically being blocked it's being blocked in the government so when you're talking about the agency you're talking about the CIA yeah that is listening in on these, yes. these proceedings and in, in, in live time trying to catch things that they don't want to be discussed on a public forum for other people to hear. Yes. Um, and that yeah, typically is you know, my understanding and what I'm told is that revolves around whatever took place at those black sites that even though we know a lot about what happened there, we don't know everything. And, and I think there is a big concerted effort to keep that as much as possible under the radar. But the impact that is having is that justice isn't being doled out perhaps as effectively as it should be. And at the end of the day, you know, I do see so many stories that are feeling very sorry for these detainees, etc. Well, my sympathies are with the victim's families. I think they're the ones that, that aren't seeing justice. There was, there was one family there when I was there, and I did put in a request, but they mm -hmm. decided that they didn't want to speak. So, of course, I respect that. Um, but, yeah, they sort of come. They, they are invited to, to come to those trials um, as they happen, to the pretrials as they happen. Um, and just so you, for your understanding, too, these pretrials are kind of vetting information and, and sources and things if a potential trial happens. But the chances of a trial happening are even so slim. It's just, it's just so frustrating, this whole process, and that it's been going on so long. And there was, um, you know, I'll give you one example of one of the reasons that nothing is really happening is there was a judge that was presiding over um, for four years over Guantanamo Bay. And so four years, these, these pre-trials were happening. And then it was found out that the judge was applying to be an immigration judge uh, with the U.S. government and hadn't disclosed that. So they literally threw out four years of testimony and that judge was removed. Like four years of our money that we're spending as U.S. taxpayers in Guantanamo Bay gone like that. And that's just one example of the many different things and excuses and problems and the slowness and the frustration like they were even going into closed sessions on open you know unclassified documents like it just is an incredibly slow pace to work and i it's hard to to wrap your head around why this is still happening all these years later and 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 you can see um 
uh, yeah, that's just one of many parts of, of why it's not kind of being closed down because there is 32 or perhaps 31 now detainees left. 19 of them have already been cleared for release, but yet are still there. Um, so you still have, you know, a significant chunk. It's certainly down a lot more from the 780 that have passed through Guantanamo. But it's um, it's sort of at this point now where obviously who are left are well, very high value uh, oh, detainees. Well, you got to go back to the story what about do you why do? it matters. It, it ma we're talking about the war on terror. Justice has to be served in it, that is a priority. National security is also a huge priority. And there's different percentages that you may hear from different experts about the people that have been released from Gitmo returning to terrorism. You know, I've heard 30%, sometimes higher than that. It's tough to put a percentage because you have to know what they're doing in the aftermath of being released. And so that's the question. What's actually safest for America? What's actually justice being served? And if these are prisoners of war, then what does that look like if we're actually serving justice? In the past, we didn't we didn't hold prisoners of war in this capacity. You know, um, it would probably be a more brutal fate. And a lot of the problem too is really the ability to collect evidence is actually very difficult um, when you're on foreign soil. For example, if somebody committed a crime in the U.S., the law enforcement would be the FBI would be able to go and request biometric data or whatever other kind of information from other agencies they could get on a particular suspect. In a foreign country, you can't do that. You can't, um, you know, go to the, necessarily the, the CIA can't go to a foreign government and request information on a particular person. And oftentimes you're looking at countries that don't even have this sort of information. So the bar of, of, ensuring that they are guilty is actually is very, very high. And it's a very challenging um, bar to meet when you are working on foreign soil. It's, it's, uh, there are so many different holes that can be poked in it, whether it's language barriers or difficulties in dealing with a hostile government or in the case of, of these black sites, um, forced confession. So there's a good chance that even, you know, for example, if some if some of the detainees were brought to the U.S., there may not be enough there to prosecute them for the crimes that that instinctually we probably know they committed. But on paper, a great question from already, one of our audience members was who's signing up to defend the detainees? So um, they have great lawyers. They have top, top lawyers, um, top people that the US government, again, we as taxpayers are paying for that defense. Um, in the particular case of Nishiri, uh, the lawyer's name was Anthony uh, Natali, and he was a, you know, a great, um, he was living, he was from Florida, um, and just sort of worked a, as a criminal defense attorney for a long time. And um, he, yeah, he had, a, you know, somebody that was very committed and very uh, determined to help his client as much as possible and, um, and give him the best uh, chance and I think that I think that it's important to remember that that's who we are and as the United States that we um, there is still that sense of of justice I mean um, innocence to proven guilty it's important to mention the USS Cole bombing because it's one of those forgotten terrorist attacks and obviously many families affected so we don't want to forget that that was one of the first signs of the a surging al-Qaeda in the meantime, though, we have uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed still being held at Gitmo. And can you talk to us a little bit about what, you know, just again, your observations of where are these, I know you weren't able to go in, but like where, why does KSM matter? And where are they being held? What does this even look like from even, even from the ground without being able to go inside? Like what were some of your observations of being there? So KSM is sort of part of, they're all being trialed together. There's five that are related to the 9-11 attacks and they're being trialed together um, essentially, they face the death penalty and Nishiri faces the death penalty. And they're the only two death penalty cases where that uh, that um, that has been put on the books. The other cases that are there that that hasn't been um, uh, put there. So I guess that's another reason why these, these two cases have been taken especially seriously. But from everything that I can gather and, and sort of understand, uh, the chances of the, these going to trial are really non-existent. Um, but you will see millions of dollars spent in, in resurrecting these sort of cabins and little kind of homes um, in Guantanamo. And that is in case they ever go to trial, they have places for uh, different attorneys and other people working on the cases to be able to stay because it will it will be a lot more people uh, pre need to be present if that happens. Um, but again, these are millions of dollars, but the chances of them going to actual trial are very slim. And I've already heard that there are 
um, talks about plea bargains and other things already happening kind of behind the scenes. So I, if I was to guess, I would imagine it won't even go to trial. There'll be some sort of plea agreement and those men will be released to a, a second country and, and maybe jailed there or, or the other thing alternatively that can happen, and this was sort of one of the reasons why journalists, they sort of stopped doing, they used to do a lot of journalist tours around that Camp X-ray area. And that stopped in about 2019 because the, uh, the general, I think, or the commander that was in charge of that area at that particular point in time said something to the effect of, um, we're going to have to look at building nursing home facilities here. And that went really viral. And of course, uh, the US government wasn't happy about that remark. And so he ended up being demoted. And after that, they stopped kind of the journalist tours. But that, the, other, the other sort of assumption is that you just wait for these people to die off. And sometimes, you know, that is the argument I hear that that's the easiest way to deal with it. Because um, again, it's such a fraught political issue of, do we release them? Do we leave them? Do we bring them to the U.S.? That you know, there are options, but nobody uh, and nobody and, wants and to take. Different them. presidents have have experienced that. I go back to President Obama because he was one of the, you know, obviously coming up after President Bush, uh, where Gitmo was opened underneath. President Obama came in and said, "We're going to shut down Gitmo. This is happening." And then a couple of years later, he could not even garner the political support to make that happen because it's so difficult. And the debate is happening within the United States about how we're handling this. Of course, also with the tension abroad. And that's what I'm curious asking you about, because obviously Guantanamo Bay, in part of what we're doing there, is to say, "Hey, if you if you are fighting against the United States of America, there's actually consequences to that. So I'm curious, you've been to Pakistan, you've been to Iraq, you've spent a lot of time in Afghanistan. Is, is the existence, is existence of Gitmo an actual deterrent? Is there, does it have a reputation? Is it something that's, that's helping us or hurting us when it comes to deterring our enemies? I think that it is, um... It is, it does, I mean, everybody knows about it, everybody talks about it. Um, Gitmo is certainly very well known. Um, and I think in many parts it is seen as um, a trigger for a lot of the attacks that continue to happen. And it's used by a lot of these terrorist groups as an excuse of, of a, a huge violation of justice. We go back to the beginning of ISIS. We remember when they were beheading American journalists, they put them in those orange jumpsuits, which was initially in the early days what Guantanamo Bay detainees were wearing. So that was, um, I guess, a, sort of a mockery and a show to say, well, we're going to get back at you for what you're doing to our people. Um, and so that is something that is still very much um, at the center, I think, of what uh, a lot of these groups are, are still very hurt by. But at the same time, I remember many years ago interviewing Dr. James Mitchell, who was the psychologist um, who was sort of implicated in one of the people that was sort of considered the architect of the enhanced interrogation program. And I remember he said that during his times that he would spend with KSM, that you know, they did talk about Guantanamo Bay and that was something he was very upset about. But his sort of analogy was, well, if it's not Guantanamo Bay, it's something else. There will always be a reason to attack the West or to take, um, to take aim at Washington or whatever that may be. If Guantanamo Bay closes tomorrow, there's something else in the wings that they're going to use. So in sort of in his summation, it wasn't necessarily um, the big kind of, uh, black eye that it, it is being portrayed as. Do you think there's any fear of being held by the United States of America if you're captured? I don't think so. I think they're very well aware that people aren't really being transferred to Guantanamo Bay anymore. Um, they're not really transferring people in. I think even the last um, uh, several years ago when they captured uh, one of the men that was involved in Benghazi, he went to Manhattan. So I think that they're not necessarily adding to Guantanamo Bay. And I think uh, yeah. foreign actors are very aware of that. So I don't- yeah, I Interesting, don't there's so many different layers anymore. to this story. All right, a, a quick final question for you, Holly, because we actually, were we able to talk? I remember before you went to Gitmo and I believe we were in some sort of communication while you were there. And I remember you feeling very unsettled personally while while there can you just talk to us just just from a personal perspective i understand the work frustrations but sometimes as a journalist when you're in a place and you've been a lot of places girl you've been a lot of places in the world <laughs> you you have this there's a sense and there's something about that sense that's a knowing and i just i was wondering if you could kind of share that 
just what it, just personally what that this period of eight days was like for you yeah i just think it had a strange energy i think that yeah it just had a bizarre energy it was there was something really depressing about it even though you're in this beautiful place and um you can go swimming and you know it's it's um it's lovely in that way but it's just something i couldn't put my finger on i, I don't know if i still can put my finger on it but just yeah it had this sort of aura of 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 being a, a depressing place and and you, you you feel very trapped and very stuck and and you can't sort of you know that you can't get out um and you have to wait for the next flight so there's always something that's a little um a little unsettling if you that. had to guess and i know that's not the business that we're in but with president biden making the declaration that he is going to close gitmo do you think in this current environment that that that's possible over the next two years is if you don't no i don't it'll never get through congress um it's just not possible but uh, you know like obama before he even came to office that was his number one thing closing debt low he realized he couldn't do it um i think all the presidents have tried you know to do that except for trump who who vowed to fill it up but i, I don't think you know it's it's a it's a it's a catchy political statement to make, but I don't actually think it will happen. It's, it's just not, it's not going to happen, but I will leave you with one interesting story about Guantanamo Bay. So when I went back to Afghanistan last year, um, I had an incident where I was in the Southern province that borders Pakistan called Hofst. And I gotten permission and I went and I knocked on the door. So we drove to Hofst and we, I knocked on the door of the governor, um, Muhammad Omari. And he let me in and was very welcoming. And he did a story. Now, Muhammad Amri was one of the, um, the Gitmo Five that were transferred for, for Bo Bogdal. So if we remember the story, Bo Bogdal was a, um, a, a private who deserted his post. He was captured by um, the Taliban and, and all sorts of you know, horrific things for five years. And then Obama, I think in 2014, um, it was a long sort of running exchange, exchanged him and, and to get him back to the U.S., they had to release five Guantanamo Bay detainees. And of course, it was a very controversial story at the time, the five for one, especially given that um, Bo was a, a deserter. But anyhow, long story short is that one of these men was Mohammed Amri, who's now the governor of Host under the Taliban. Um, and so I go to visit him and he gives me permission and we, we do an interview and he's talking about Guantanamo Bay. And at first I wasn't sure I was obviously going to bring it up, but he ended up bringing it up and he was there for 13 years and he was sort of telling me about his um, you know, awful experience there in, in his words. And anyway, he ends up giving me permission to go to these tunnels where um, the Haqqanis used to send suicide bombers in and out of Pakistan. And so I'm going and then these sort of local Taliban um, they think my Fitbit is a spy camera and I end up getting detained for a while and, and they're moving me around and it, not a pleasant experience. But at the end of the day, when we're finally able to get to a place where there was cell service and I kept saying, you know, you need to call Muhammad Amr, you need to call the governor and he'll vouch for me. And Muhammad Amr, as soon as he found out that I'd been detained, he's the one who came to my defense. He demanded they release me, demanded they get me food. He, demanded, he told them they had to get me a room, all of which I declined. I just wanted to get the heck out of there. Um, but anyway, it's just sort of a funny, ironic story is that this is one of the get my five and he was the one that what a story. came to my defense. Uh, and you always tell it so casually. Oh, there's just tunnels. <laughs> and they said, and so, <laughs> you've had some really... You have at every I've been time, detained like, three times I'm by the Taliban. Nervous about it every single time, <laughs> like your mother back at home, like, "Oh my gosh, what's going to happen next?" What did, just quickly on that though? What did he? You said he brought it up. Like, what did he say about Guantanamo? Did he have? What, what did he have to say about that experience? Um, it was funny. He just, you know, he kept saying that um, he, if he looks at something and he sees that it's made by Americans, and he hates it, but he also wants to have a good relationship with America. So it's just sort of funny. Um, he's obviously got awful memories from it, but yet at the same time, he recognizes the need for the Taliban, which is probably not going to happen anytime soon, but to have those international relations. And he recognizes America as the superpower. And, and once America, for example, if America decides to recognize the Taliban, then, then everyone else will kind of follow suit. So he's very sort of savvy in that way. Um, but he, you know, says that people constantly tell him that he should write a book about his time there because, and if I read the book, I would cry is what he says, because he says that at least in the initial days that, you know, the torture and things were, 
was pretty um, uh, pretty horrible. And what he would call torture, others would call interrogation. And then the, and that's also back here at home, the clashes between that obviously have been well reported and well told. Fascinating, Holly. That's, um, I don't know if very much can make you cry. I think you're pretty tough. You're pretty tough. Yeah. Um, no. I well, thank you. This has been super valuable. Uh, what a story to, to end on as well. and gives us a lot to think about. Again, there's a lot of different sides to this story. We do, to your point though, and I think it's an important one to go back to, is that we do talk a lot about the detainees. We have a, a rich conversation about them. Um, we don't have exactly the same amount of time spent on the victims of 9-11 and those that made the ultimate sacrifice in the war on terror. And that does feel a little unbalanced, but this is where we are right now. So as long as we can recognize that, say it out loud, I think it's also really important that um, so many, so many families have been affected by all the events of the last 20 years. So thank you, Holly. It's great to see you as always. Everyone continue to follow Holly McKay. Thank you so much. Thank you course, for your support. I really appreciate uh, love it. hearing her stories. Love Holly. Thank you so much, Holly. I also want to make sure that everyone knows Holly has a book coming out that's a phenomenal photography book with her own observations uh, in Afghanistan with her photographer, Jake, who's super talented and they've traveled all over the country. And Holly, that's something, can they just buy that through your website? I know you're not promoting it, but I think it's really important work. This is a very specific chapter in history that she was able to document that no one else was. Yeah, it's through uh, the Daniela Publications website. But if you go to my Instagram and you look in the stories, you'll see the link uh, where it says books. Holly, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone as well thank for following you. along on Smarter News. We're going to continue to follow this story. There's supposedly more news coming, including that we could see more detainees released. As Holly mentioned, the numbers are from the Defense Department, 34 detainees that are remaining uh, 20 that could be transferred right now that are approved for transfer, three are under review. Two have been convicted and are apparently serving sentences. That leaves several others that were wondering, you know, they're going to trial. If they're in pretrial, remember, pretrial is pretrial. We're a long way off from getting somewhere uh, as far as seeing a real legal trial on any of these particular, you know, especially these big cases. So it's a story we'll continue to watch. And it's a story that's been part of our, our own um, discussion about the war on terror for the last 20 plus years. It's hard to believe it, but it but that's the case. So we'll continue to cover it. Great to have that invaluable perspective from Holly. And if you have questions on this, we want to make sure we answer those. You know, foreign policy is personal. There's all this conversation in the news about foreign policy. You know, too complicated. No one understands it. It's, you know, this is about faraway places. This is the stuff that I was told in the newsroom before. I don't believe it. Foreign policy is personal and impacts all of our lives. And so we have to talk about it. And we have great ways to do that. So keep those questions coming. And thank you so much for your support of smarternews.com. I'll check in with you guys later. Have a great day. Bye.